Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the web conference hosted by the Foundation for European Progressive uh, Studies. My name is Laszlo Ander. I'm the Secretary General of FEPS, and I would like to welcome our three uh, panelists. First of all, Elisa Ferreira, uh, EU Commissioner, responsible for cohesion and reforms. And um, secondly, Jakob von Weizsäcker, who is the Chief Economist of uh, the Federal uh, Ministry uh, of Finance in Berlin. And last but not least, Alex Kmelarz, uh, who is the Deputy Minister for European Affairs uh, in the Czech Republic. And um, Elisa is joining us from the Berlemont building, uh, Jakob from Berlin and Alex uh, from Prague. We try to make it as European as uh, possible on this extraordinary day. Between the four of us, we have seen quite a few budgets in our lives, in our working experience, but never such a budget revolution, which is just being uh, taken place um, in, at the European uh, level. Of course, uh, we were not aware of this coincidence uh, when this program was first uh, installed in the plans of FEBS. Um, we started to work on this together with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Berlin, uh, which has a tradition to organize in May, uh, days of progressive economic policy. And we joined forces apart from FES, uh, the German Trade Union Confederation, DGB, the Macroeconomic Policy Institute, IMK, um, but also when it became an online event, um, the Pablo Iglesias Foundation from Madrid also joined the team of um, organizers. Now, uh, yesterday we already had a first round um, hosted by Maria Joao Rodriguez with uh, Commissioner Gentiloni, with Minister Calvino, as well as Nobel laureate uh, Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, but today we have something new, something absolutely concrete, a newly designed um, uh, recovery plan with um, a totally new approach uh, to uh, the budget of the European Union. I think many of us can say that this is something we have been waiting for, uh, but specifically in the COVID crisis, we can also say that this is something we have been encouraging in the discussions of the uh, recent months to, to grow up to the task, to be bold, uh, to, to deliver uh, real tools which would be effective uh, not only against the health crisis, but against the economic consequences of this terrible uh, health crisis, which uh, we are going uh, through. Um, first of all, um, I would like to invite um, Elisa Ferreira um, to uh, present her views uh, coming almost directly from the meeting of the College of Commissioners and explain to us how uh, he, he can uh, see uh, these absolutely innovative approach uh, to the recovery budget of the European Union. Elisa, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation to participate. And I think you got it absolutely right, Laszlo, when you have chosen this day for this conference. Uh, because as you mentioned, uh, this was the day when um, I think there, I, I consider this a, an historical day in the, in the long history of Europe. Uh, when, uh, I mean, when uh, faced with a, a huge, a huge crisis uh, that cannot be blamed on anybody, um, this, this time it was a virus. Uh, the virus, um, I mean, uh, touched uh, everybody, but, um, but of course the, the impact uh, in the different economies and in different regions varied a lot according to the, to the characteristics of those regions. So um, I'm not talking now about the immediately health uh, consequences and the loss of life, which was absolutely dramatic, but uh, there are regions of, of Europe that uh, almost didn't suffer any, any losses and nevertheless, they lost completely their business model and their economy is completely ruined. I was uh, speaking with someone from the island of Reunion that is, uh, that didn't have any, almost any casualties. And they were telling me, okay, our economy is completely lost because they live on tourism and they live on exports of raw materials and transports were stopped. So the economic crisis touches everybody 
uh, but it touches all, a cert, certain areas much more than others. Uh, also, the response from the, from the Commission, uh, the immediate response uh, was, uh, was an emergency response. Of course, uh, we, what we did was, in fact, to try to, uh, I mean, to liberate the state aid uh, conditionalities so that uh, those member states that could afford it uh, could support their economies. And, uh, and it, it, it is a very good kind of approach. But on the other hand, certain member states have very deep pockets and the other member states cannot afford to support their economies. So the risk is that we end up in a complete imbalanced situation. Uh, and on top of this, uh, what uh, as, uh, as Commission for Cohesion, what we did was in fact to allow for reprogramming of the last year of the multi-annual uh, period of, uh, of, 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 of support for cohesion. Uh, that's where we are, we, we are now. So uh, we really did something absolutely, uh, I mean, uh, unique uh, also in the cohesion policy that was to allow for reprogramming between regions, between uh, funds, and uh, to redirect the available instruments and available funds to tackle the health crisis, to support small and medium enterprises, and to support the, the jobs. Uh, at the same time, there were initiatives from the Council, as you know. So there was this initiative uh, from the uh, line of the SM to support uh, lending to member states to, I mean, to help them tackle the, the, the cost, the health cost. There was this reinforcement of the, of, the, of the IB in order to be able to give support to small and medium enterprises. Uh, and there was a new instrument that I find very interesting that is SURE. Uh, and SURE was really an initiative uh, to support uh, those member states that uh, created this kind of short time uh, labor that Germany practiced for a long time, but other member states didn't have it so that you don't put everybody from a, from a crisis into the unemployment market and that you keep the link of the employee and the firm, uh, hoping for better times. And there is this state support uh, for, for this uh, difference between the hours worked and the full payment, uh, full payment for, for, for the wage. So these were the immediate reactions. But of course, we needed something blunt, something strong, and uh, since uh, very early, as soon as the Council also uh, recommended uh, that, that uh, I mean, the Commission uh, uh, should start preparing something more strong, more relevant, so that this, uh, this massive uh, slowdown of the economy, we are talking about uh, an average estimated uh, average recession of 7.5%. Uh, I, the, the expectations are that it will be even deeper, but this is twice the level that we had in the 2008 crisis. So it's really a massive thing, and for certain member states, it's two digits. In, in so it's it's since the World War, it's really something never seen. Uh, and uh, I didn't mention, but I should have mentioned also the ECB uh, initiative. Probably Jacob can explain more. The limits of this, but anyway, it was this seven, uh, uh, 750 uh, billion uh, initiative to, to support the debt uh, market of Europe. But, uh, but nevertheless, we needed uh, some, some, uh, some recovery instrument. And it is this recovery instrument that the Commission has presented today. Uh, I think it, it was very, very important the pressure from a lot of member states that immediately started saying that we cannot have an internal market, we cannot have a common currency uh, of an, an imbalanced and, uh, and a non-perfect monetary area. Uh, if we have such a, a, a major risk of uh, increasing the imbalances, and so we would risk the whole European functioning if we didn't have this kind of uh, strong recovery recovery element. Uh, so uh, what, uh, what was done today was exactly this. Uh, it was very, very relevant, the initiative by Germany and France uh, to come forward and to make a proposal. 
because uh, this immediately set the level and or organized somehow the margins of maneuver uh, and opening uh, somehow the floor for the Commission to come forward. And so the Commission came forward today with the uh, proposal for uh, five, 500 billion of, uh, of, uh, of grants, uh, 250 billion of loans, uh, to be, I mean, the, the Commission had already gone to the market uh, borrowing, but never to this dimension. So it is something unique. Uh, of course, the uh, Commission is exploring the difference between the margin for the increase in all resources in relation to the actual expenditure of the budget and trying to use this margin uh, to guarantee the, the debt. Uh, there is a dimension of uh, revisiting own resources, which I find very, very relevant. And the s and has, uh, has been fighting for this for a long time to reassess the own resources dimension. And, and I think that's very important that you develop it, uh, but to be used in uh, uh, three types of the initiatives. The first one is uh, very much related to reforms and cohesion. Uh, because that's the crucial thing. So we'll have uh, uh, resilience and, uh, and, um, and reform kind of, um, of uh, package uh, in order to support the reforms, the structural reforms in the good sense of the word. I mean, uh, helping member states to get reorganized and to reorganize their way of functioning in order to grow faster, to converge faster. Uh, there is a, a dimension, an immediate dimension of react you that is based on cohesion, but uh, I mean stimulating immediately the continuation of uh, something, th what we did uh, in, uh, in this initiative that I mentioned before, of re allowing for the reallocation of the cohesion funds in order to address the crisis. So kind of making a transition to the new uh, multi-annual framework. Uh, on the other hand, to have a package of uh, support uh, to uh, companies uh, that uh, will be losing uh, their equity due to the crisis. So something that would compensate for the state aid that is being given by the most powerful member states in order not to reestablish a certain level playing field in the internal market, but this comes together with a new industrial policy, uh, with a new perception of the role of industry in Europe. And there is also a third dimension in which we tackle all the other issues that uh, are so dear to the European citizens, such as a reinforcement of the horizon of research, of innovation, a line for uh, health and uh, health strategy. Of course, health is a competence of member states, but we realize that the Commission could do a lot of things in coordinating the work of member states. Uh, a, a dimension of, uh, of helping uh, the, 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 the member states that are not yet member states, but the borders of Europe, a neighborhood uh, policy, a line, a reinforced line for, uh, for the cohesion part of the agricultural policy. So there is a huge list of elements that uh, are, uh, I mean, supposed uh, to support the, the, the citizens, to support the convergence inside Europe so that we get together in a better shape and looking forward, looking to the future and not repeating what we were doing before. So from all this, there is a very strong uh, element of uh, uh, big concern uh, in relation to the climate, to the greening, to the environment, uh, and of course to the digital and to the modernity that we need to introduce in our, in our markets. So I, I think that this proposal from the Commission, uh, I hope, I personally hope that it, uh, it, it, it is confirmed by the Parliament. I came from the Parliament now and the, the speech is from the most relevant uh, parties, inclusive our own, uh, I mean, the SND was extremely positive. Uh, we'll see uh, how the Council reacts, but uh, the last element that I would like to stress is the need for speed and the for, for a quick delivery, because uh, what we have to do has got to be done now and not within one or two years, 
And so we have got to accelerate procedures in order that the instruments are operational and they, they get to the citizens, to the firms, to the companies uh, as soon as possible because the crisis is aggravated from day to day as uh, certain, uh, certain uh, sitting on the, on, on the fence to see how, how, how things go uh, materializes in, uh, in the closure of enterprises, closures of companies, and, and, and this cannot go on. So the sooner we get these measures on, the best. So I think now, uh, I mean, uh, political families uh, should get united, should get very vocal and try to convince the most reluctant member states uh, because in fact, even the most reluctant ones, they live from the internal market and they live from the free movement of goods, of capital. And so we have got to be very much aware that if half of Europe is in a, in a deep depression, there is no way out for anybody and uh, you cannot uh, get out of it by yourself. So uh, that's what I wanted to share with you in a very special day when I'm really very, very happy uh, that, that the Commission uh, was, uh, I mean, used the possibility to be so strong, so blunt and, uh, and, uh, and from my point of view, up to what we should uh, do um, to satisfy also the expectations of our citizens and to re-establish this uh, mutual trust uh, in relation to the citizens and the European institutions. So uh, a, a, a big, big thank you to all of you. I think uh, Jacob and, uh, and other colleagues were very, also very active, I'm sure, uh, behind the, the curtains uh, in order to put pressure on, uh, on, this, um, on this agenda. Uh, and, uh, and now we have another step. It's the beginning of a new era. It's the, f the end of a first phase, but there is a lot of work to be done and nothing is granted for time being. So it's just a step, but a very positive one from my point of view. So if, you, if I can, uh, I mean, if, I'm, uh, if, you, if, if I can share with you more of the available information, I'm very willing to do so. I apologize for not being able to keep with you for the whole day, but it, it is such a busy day due to this fact that I, I, I cannot actually uh, follow the whole, the whole discussion. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Ferreira. I know your time is limited and uh, you have very little uh, time left uh, uh, with us. Um, can I have two requests? One is to stay for a family photo, which simply means that uh, the panelists and myself uh, try to present an acceptable smile uh, to our colleague Elena Gil, who is going to take this uh, screenshot about us. I remain also silent for a moment in order to facilitate this. Is Alex also there? Yes, I am. Okay. So hopefully this was uh, good enough for Elena. And um, if you have one more minute, um, um, because I think um, our listeners and viewers realize that uh, you're not only a former MEP, but also a former central banker and um, touched upon monetary policy uh, as well, although uh, delegated it to Iago. But uh, can we already say that while in the past crisis, it was the ECB, which at the end of the day saved uh, the project. And now fiscal policy will play its role. Or in other words, fiscal policy will become a real player in European macroeconomics. Would you agree with that? Yes, I think, I think this is a very, very nice way to put it, uh, uh, dear Laszlo, because in fact, I think the monetary pol policy had reached its limits. Uh, uh, it, was, it saved the euro, that's, that's a fact. But, uh, but it, 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 it has its limits and uh, somehow uh, it, was, it had uh, almost exhausted its capacity to act. And even uh, it, was, uh, it was very well known in the previous period, I mean, in the previous uh, uh, mandate of the leadership of the central bank when uh, Mario Draghi uh, took this, uh, I mean, this very daring initiative that uh, more and more he was saying that the central bank could not be the only player in the, in the scene. And that there was something that was needed in terms of the fiscal policies. 
and uh, and in fact the present budget of the commission was exhausted so uh, we could not i mean we could not do um, a lot with the, with the budget that was around the, it's always this discussion but it's one percent of the gni so one percent what is this in terms where if you compare it with the federal budget i mean of course we it, it's a completely different situation but anyway in terms of size it's absolutely it's a minor minor thing uh, so this this is a blunt response yes we were always asking the countries that could afford it so that they could really open their pockets now they open their pockets uh, not necessarily for public uh, works and uh, and this kind of uh, broad horizontal policies, but to support their companies. Uh, this was a good thing in a way. Yes, it is good. It is very important that the engines of Europe go on. But on the other hand, when the, these, uh, these deep pockets are used to support companies uh, and, um, and the national based companies, of course, we have a huge risk of distorting completely the internal market when the other companies cannot be supported to the same, to the same level. So something had to be done in order to reestablish uh, a level playing field. I support it completely, this state aid waiver, because, I mean, at least uh, there is some, uh, some oxygen and some growth in Europe. But of course, when it comes to support to individual enterprises and when we let go, these uh, normal rules that control uh, this kind of, um, of excessive support to certain uh, companies. Uh, of course, we have got to compensate it somehow. Um, it will not be perfect. At this moment, we have about 2.3 trillion of, of, support, of uh, support aid and, uh, and half of it belongs to the strongest member of our community. And then it is, I mean, in six or seven member states, you exhaust, exhaust the whole amount. Uh, for the companies that are located in other countries, of course, nothing can be compared. And those countries, they cannot borrow in the market because if they borrow to support, uh, in the medium to long term, they will be in, uh, in trouble. And we have gone through this in the previous crisis. So there is no point in addressing it from that point of view. This is reason also why uh, the grants, uh, of course, they cannot be, I'm not a, a person that is in favor of uh, this kind of helicopter money. That's not what I'm talking about. I think in member states will have really to organize very specific uh, proposals and agendas, but also in these agendas, in these reforms, uh, there will be benefit for all of us. And I hope this is a relaunch. I, I tend not to use the word uh, solidarity because it, sometimes it's mixed up with charity and uh, we, re we, we, we went back to the Marshall Plan. Uh, there were lots of talk about the Marshall Plan. I don't see Marshall Plan as a charitable thing, uh, initiative. I see the Marshall Plan as a very intelligent win-win situation in a period where the relaunch of Europe was absolutely needed. And, uh, and I think everybody, Europe benefited a lot, but I, I, I don't think that the United States benefited less. So this kind of very limited discussion uh, that sometimes uh, catches all our energies, I think it's very non-productive because if we look into medium to long term, uh, we, 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 we gain, there is a kind of win-win situation because uh, even with cohesion policy, we know that a very substantial part of the funds go back in terms of, um, of, uh, of procurement into the countries that, uh, that were more active in, 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 uh, in financing the cohesion. So it, there is, in fact, this kind of sharing of gains that, uh, that I think uh, if this project is, uh, if this package is really approved by member states, can benefit everybody and can really boost our economy in a, in, in a way uh, that must be future oriented and based on the new axis for growth uh, and uh, climate, energy and, uh, and, uh, and the digital and um, I mean, will be really science, technology, uh, this will be the future and Europe uh, has got to be back into the globalized world with uh, a very active and strong voice, uh, more intelligent than in the past and learning from the, from the lessons of the past.
Thank you so much. Um, we understand that the name of the game is to prevent a divergence um, in the European Union and especially in the Eurozone and your own portfolio cohesion is going to be an absolutely strategic one in this uh, process. So uh, we're welcoming again this uh, new proposal and thank you for your time and um, hope to see you on other occasions with FEPS. Thank you very, very much. All the best to you. Let's keep in touch. And, uh, and uh, a big, a big uh, thank you to the work that you do. And, um, and please speak out, be vocal, because uh, now we need the second phase to be running fast and in the right direction. And this is the approval by from the Commission. And I, 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 I think you are in the best possible position to do that. And the ministers that are here and the representatives of governments, uh, my appeal is always to, is also to them because now the, the ball is on your field, so please kick it in the right direction. And here I go back to the preliminary talk that we had before connecting about about the football and the goals. So please score because <laughs> the European citizens needs that uh, the institutions score for the benefit. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Commissioner Ferreira. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. Um, Dear friends, um, um, dear colleagues, um, now we continue with uh, Jakob von Weizsäcker and Alex Schmeller. And um, I would also like to highlight that um, the title today is not only the EU recovery budget, but also the German presidency. Because today only a launch uh, was witnessed uh, from the side of um, the European Commission. But to adopt everything, of course, it's very important that um, a, a, a political convergence is taking place between the member states, a meeting of minds, but also the meeting of the political objectives in the European Union. Um, I think in order to uh, launch the second um, uh, part of the discussion, um, I should ask both Jakob and Alex um, about um, what you think is the most important in this new strategy because I think we can speak about a new recovery strategy of the European Union from a budgetary point of view. What would you like to highlight? And perhaps what would you see as uh, most difficult um, in the coming period? Jakob, would you like to start? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laszlo. And um, I mean, it, the timing is excellent. It, it was wonderful to, to uh, see uh, Elisa again. Um, we were colleagues at the European Parliament for four and a half years, um, and uh, to to be together on such a day that's 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 wonderful. I have to admit I haven't seen all the details of the Commission's proposal yet, but from what I've read so far and from what I Elisa told us, it is a very impressive uh, proposal they're, they're 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 putting forward, uh, and I'm delighted. Uh, that the um, uh, Franco-German initiative, um, uh, I think, was of some help at least uh, in order to um, prepare what is now a, a, very, um, a very impressive plan. And um, I would say the, clearly the most important um, aspect of that plan is that it signals to everybody, it signals to every European that we're in this together. This is a joint challenge and we will uh, tackle it jointly, um, and that uh, um, Europeans, no matter where they live, uh, in which region, in which member state, they can rely um, on the European Union um, for support. Um, and at the same time, I think it's a very strong signal also to financial markets that um, when push comes to shove, um, Europe sticks together. And I think that's also a very important signal um, to instill confidence in uh, the European project. So I think taking together um, what was presented today is, is critical in order to um, instill the kind of confidence that, uh, that, uh, that Europe needs in order to successfully um, uh, um, address the challenge of this horrible crisis. Um, a second point I would like to make, a little bit in response to what El Elisa has said, one way to look at um, the 
um, solvency support instrument that she mentioned, uh, um, which is going to be set up at the EIB, is in terms of level playing field. You know, some countries like Germany doing a little bit more, others doing a little bit less, partly um, uh, for available, uh, availability of institutions. We were very lucky that KFW is, uh, has, has a good model in order to support companies in normal times. And we were able to leverage that model very quickly in order to support companies in these very difficult times. Um, but I think that's a little bit stopping short of you know, reality today. What we are seeing in, in Germany is a reality where many companies uh, are not German. Um, they're not German in, in terms of, you know, the majority of people that work for that company uh, are working in Germany. They're not German in the sense that the majority of goods they produce are sold in Germany. They're, they're truly European. Um, and while, of course, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, in a crisis, you have to do what you can do um, for, for a national instrument to support these European companies who happen to be active in, 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 in Germany, um, uh, of course, uh, it, it's an interesting question, you know, with a company where only say 10%, and um, we have examples like that, where only 10% of the workers are working in Germany, should it be the German taxpayer alone uh, guaranteeing um, the loans that we're giving them? Clearly, the, the European nature, the single market, uh, um, it's a reality today, calls for a, a, a European approach and, and I think that's why we need the EIB and not so much this idea, you know, somebody is doing too much and now there needs to be compensation. And so I think uh, while, while this is in nuance, um, I think this is a much more European way to explain what's going on. We have a single market. We have European companies. And it makes a lot of sense to have tools uh, available that go beyond the nation state. Uh, and I think that's part of the Commission proposal, and that's a very good thing. Um, and what I was struck by in the recovery and resilience facility, which is the largest part um, of the Commission proposal, I understand um, there clearly is a logic that takes um, the challenge of COVID-19 seriously. This is not about juste retour, as uh, normally perhaps would be the case in any kind of uh, you know, Brussels uh, uh, financial uh, negotiation. This is not the logic of, um, you know, um, rich and poor regions. This is the logic of the COVID-19 challenge. And I think that's very important um, that people understand we have a specific instrument for a specific situation. And I think one of the reasons why um, we um, will be able to have, I hope, very much hope, I mean, it's a consensus-based decision-making process, but I very much hope that we will have this kind of, um, uh, my minister called it, a uh, Hamiltonian uh, moment, um, is uh, because this is a situation where clearly it's nobody's fault. Nobody can help be held responsible for, um, uh, for, for COVID-19, for this pandemic. Uh, for, for the, 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 the uh, catastrophe, both in health and economic terms that it brings about. And so I think it's clear for everybody that this is not about moral hazard, about creating the wrong incentives. This is about um, uh, sticking together, or let me use a German word, which I quite like. It's, uh, um, it's Europe as a Schicksalsgemeinschaft, a community of fate, um, uh, trying to come to terms uh, with this challenging uh, situation. And I, I think that's a good thing. And, and let me close by saying the way that I would think about this recovery phase, I think it's useful to say there are really three elements and I think they're all there. Uh, the first element is of course, um, protecting, protecting people against the disease, uh, protecting um, companies against uh, sort of a complete disappearance of, of their market for, for a couple of uh, weeks or months and protecting um, uh, employees against the fallout of that crisis. Um, we we uh, in particular use this instrument of short time work and, and it's working quite well. Uh, so, so, so this is 
this is one pillar of, of what we need and sure is a European reflection um, of that. Then there's a second pillar that we need Clearly, um, we need both sectorally and in the aggregate um, an element of fiscal stimulus. And uh, uh, Laszlo, you asked uh, Elisa Ferreira about the interplay between uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy. It is quite clear in times where interest rates are high, monetary policy can do much more of the heavy lifting. And in times where interest rates are ultra low or basically zero or below zero, um, their fiscal policy has to do more of the heavy lifting, and I think uh, that's reflected in, in the Commission's uh, proposal, and, and, and that's a good thing. And thirdly, um, and I think that's also very important, we need a transformative pillar. This is not a just short-term Keynesianism. We need this transformative element because there are these massive challenges linked to climate change, linked to digitalization, a couple of other developments uh, that make it absolutely necessary that we use the momentum that we have in order to have a transformative agenda. And um, uh, there are the bad news uh, which we have in the COVID crisis that it's not clear uh, it will simply be a V-shaped recovery and we'll be very quickly back to where we were in 2019. Maybe it's more of a sort of medium term challenge Mm -hmm. And that also means that certain instruments that don't just work like a firework, um, but that have a slightly longer time horizon and, and are therefore um, a much more readily transformative, should be part of the package. Um, and so if we manage to have these three pillars at the national level and at the European level, I think we'll be doing a good job and uh, sort of as an afterthought, what's very important to keep in mind, and that's why I think a, a, a grants-based approach for the recovery fund is, is critical. Uh, we have an instrument um, uh, called the ESM, now with a new window, um, that uh, is able, uh, at least for your area countries, um, to uh, lend. Um, and mm. so if we need a lending instrument, we already have it. We don't need to create a substitute for that. We need something that is largely complementary uh, uh, to the possibilities we have in other uh, instruments and I think uh, the Commission proposal to a large extent um, uh, uh, recognizes that and uh, um, has a, 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 firm, a, a firm emphasis on, on, on the grant element of the whole setup. That, that, that would be uh, sort of uh, all I have to offer by way of introductory remarks and I'm now looking uh, forward to the second presentation and then of course the lively discussion. Indeed, uh, thank you so much. Um, in the meantime, um, I would like to uh, tell um, our viewers that indeed the uh, questions are arriving, so we will come back to specific aspects of the German uh, plans and the German uh, presidency agenda. Um, but let's move on to Alesh, and um, I should also introduce him by saying that um, in fact the Czech presidency was already in the pipeline, because in two weeks, two years time, uh, you will uh, you will enter, and I was reading it recently that the preparations for the Czech presidency uh, are uh, already starting. So, what's the perspective on all this in Prague? Tell us about it. Well, first of all, Laszlo, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. I also want to thank your colleagues from FEPS. Uh, it is really a timely uh, moment to to speak about those measures, not just because. As you said, uh, there is, or as we all uh, seen here uh, today, uh, there was a presentation of the new proposal on the recovery fund and on the uh, on the future Europe uh, instrument. So, in this respect, it is it is a very interesting moment. I have barely had the time to analyze what we had uh, published today, and it is indeed uh, a moment also when we have a lot of discussions taking taking place in this manner or or in other ones. Uh, through uh, video conferences and where we do not have enough, let's say, normal times to, to set and see and look at the multi-annual financial framework and to maybe discuss actually also the governance uh, changes. Uh, first of all, I have to say also on uh, the topic uh, that it is a very good moment in terms of the German presidency now 
looking in a new eye on uh, the next half a year, on the on the next semester, actually, for somehow fight and uh, and to look very specifically on the challenges that were uh, created by the COVID crisis. And uh, I cannot really agree more on what was said in terms of that nobody can be blamed for this crisis. And there is a clear structural difference between what we've seen during the last financial crisis and between what we saw here. Uh, in 2009, and we have noticed that all of us, uh, there was a, a certain sentiment of blame uh, and shame uh, and in this respect, this time, it seems that we indeed have to agree that the shock is external and it should have also a very different impact on, uh, on the response. Uh, in those terms, nevertheless, what is not on our side is time and the ability to act. If you remember, actually, in the financial crisis first, we had a very clear capacity to meet. I mean, at some point, the prime ministers, they were meeting basically more than once a month. Uh, and uh, they, they could decide, they could really uh, take time to, to, to respond. This time, there is a huge responsibility on the European Commission in their today's proposal. And there is now, as uh, Commissioner Ferreira said, a responsibility on our side, on, on the side of governments and of uh, different uh, parts of administration to somehow absorb it and to be able to find a solution, which is on uh, one side a challenge to do so in a very short period of time because we have roughly 25 days somehow to agree uh, or to uh, postpone the decision on the next uh, multi-annual financial framework and on the recovery measures that were presented today. So it would be very challenging. But would I have to, would I have to um, really underline in, a, in an analytical way here is that it will not be easy. We see the situation here from a Central European perspective as uh, one of, uh, of a really very deep crisis but that, unfortunately, from the beginning, the, the reaction was national. And we were looking really at the situation uh, taking place in China and then in other countries as, a, as an avalanche that was basically taking place very far away. And we were looking and we were contemplating what is going to happen. And then suddenly it was here and nobody had time to prepare. And even though we had some signals uh, of warnings, uh, we were not able really to create structure. And that, that was something very critical during the financial crisis, that it was, uh, it was basically firefight and at the same time it was also um, uh, institutional creation. So there was a constitutional uh, debate in a way and at the same time there was a firefighting. And in this respect we are even more constrained time-wise uh, today to create a new governance structure and at the same time to, to be able to, to fight the fires that are now in the European economy, mostly in the European economy, I mean, taking aside the, the health effects of, of the overall crisis. And uh, I have to underline the fact that there are uh, still, and I completely agree with Jakob on the fact that we are a, a union of, of common faith. Uh, at the same time, we have also passed. And uh, the last 10 years have not seen um, a solution to many of the debates that we had inside the Eurozone. And the crisis comes in a moment when even, you know, 10 year old debates uh, are not and were not solved. And we had several Euro summits uh, before the crisis that came and that were discussing a very similar topic to, to the one that we have presented today about the solidarity, the financial and the monetary solidarity inside the European Union, how it could be solved and how uh, individual member states can, uh, can play a role in this. And uh, to, to this extent, I think that it will be very critical for us to take time now to, to look at the proposal in the next three weeks and to see whether we can first respond very fast, but also to prepare instruments and institutional instruments for probably the second wave, which might come quite soon and, and probably in autumn, so that we are already prepared. And uh, to somehow also tell the citizens that we are here not to, or that the European Union is not here to only just uh, coordinate, but to take a lead actually in those measures. And we are very hopeful in this and, and for this, 
And uh, me as a European citizen and as a European, I'm really looking forward to this. What I wanted to underline as one, one element actually of uh, what you asked, Laszlo, is that uh, anyway, the old debates are still there. We see the frugal four, we see the more, let's say, ambitious uh, member states, and we are ha very happy to see Germany uh, among the most uh, ambitious ones. We are also very happy, and I think it can, could, could not be chosen uh, uh, more wisely to have a German presidency just upcoming, actually, to the, uh, to the biggest outbreak, the pandemic outbreak, actually, in the history of the EU, because, indeed, there is a heavy weight on Germany and on its, uh, not just the, let's say, heavy weight in economic terms, but also on its institutional and political capacity to act in, in this respect. And uh, we are very hopeful that, indeed, the instruments that we will all have to be prepared to use, uh, not just for the economic recovery, but also for uh, fighting the, the health issues, will be, um, will be in place actually on time and that the moderation from the German presidency will be high. Um, but uh, there is still an aspect that has to be underlined of the fact that since we do not have time, uh, we also do not have time as uh, ministries and uh, many politicians do not have time to consult with citizens and to somehow absorb the uh, character of uh, the revolutionary character of the measures, including the MFF as it was presented. And in this respect, uh, there is still a risk that the, uh, the un insufficient time that we have ahead of us could create problems in terms of agreeing to the final proposals. Uh, what I have to underline is that we will do our utmost, of course, in, in this respect, but uh, that it is not guaranteed. We know how much um, time it has taken for the member states to agree to at least some elements of the debate on the multi-annual financial framework. And uh, it was a really heavy debate and we were not at the end of it. It took more than two years actually for us to, to discuss just, you know, very basic negotiation uh, box on this, uh, on this matter. And now uh, a revolution comes and we have to decide in three weeks. So I'm very hopeful uh, that in the next three to four weeks we will be able to, to find a response to it and that uh, leaders on the 18 could uh, really find uh, one voice in terms of addressing the, those issues and uh, that we can have a common response uh, in this respect. Thank you, Laszlo. Thank you very much, Alesh, um, for the thoughts. And um, we already started to receive questions from the audience, which I'm sharing in the chat box with um, uh, the panelists. And while they are preparing uh, their answers, let me announce uh, that, of course, this event is um, very much visible not only on Facebook, uh, but also um, running on Twitter, where the preferred hashtags are uh, Progressive Econ, that was already in place yesterday, but also from today, the very popular Next Generation EU is um, in circulation. So if you would like to tweet the thoughts you heard from Elisa Ferreira, Jakob von Weizsäcker, or Alex Meraj, uh, then uh, use uh, some of these uh, hashtags. But I also prepared a little reminder for um, uh, the yesterday discussion, because we all spoke about the paradigm change. Alex even said a little revolution is happening in budgetary terms, the Copernican uh, revolution, if you can use this expression uh, from a Central European perspective. Um, so, if Elena has me, uh, then uh, there is a little quiz about um, uh, the, the uh, uh, debate yesterday, which is now visible on the screen. Um, yesterday we had this discussion with the uh, panelists I listed uh, in the morning, and one of them said the following. Uh, Europe will not have a strong recovery if large parts of Europe are not having a strong recovery, i.e. we have to be together in this uh, exercise preventing a divergence and to ensure that we can emerge from the recession together. Uh, who was the one uh, who said it this way? Uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate, 
Nadia Calvino, Spanish Minister, Paolo Gentiloni, EU Commissioner for the Economy, or Maria Joao Rodriguez, the FEPS uh, President. I think um, we have a limited time uh, for uh, clicking on uh, the preferred um, name and submit it. Um, not a long time and I can also add that they basically uh, agreed on this idea but it was one of them who said it uh, uh, this way. Um, others expressed uh, their views about the importance of European solidarity in different ways. But the European solidarity, not only in spirit, but also in material sense, was a very, very important part of the discussion yesterday. And I think it, 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 it remains one also uh, today. Uh, can we close this round of uh, the votes and maybe see what was the outcome, who is the supposed originator of uh, this. Can we show it now? The, pub, the public bet on Joseph Stiglitz, 50%. The public bet on Joseph Stiglitz, 50%, which is the right um, uh, answer indeed. That's what he said. In fact, there's going to be also a video, so if you are interested, you can see it. Uh, again, I, I think some of uh, the audience already started to vote on the second question, but we will come to that a little bit uh, later. Uh, now, uh, I think we should, we should ask a few questions um, regarding um, uh, German presidency and the recovery budget, which came from the audience, for example, uh, whether this signals a kind of um, institutional reform also. Does it mean um, that uh, these new ideas, which are somehow improvised at the time of uh, 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 an emergency, they would also pave the way uh, to something more permanent? Um, this, for example, has been the question from Paolo Meucci from the European Parliament about the institutional reform or the possibility of that in the European uh, context. Uh, what would you respond? Uh, to this. Perhaps Jakob would start? I think, I, I think that's a very good question. And let me answer it in the following way. Um, if uh, you look at history, if you look at history both in terms of um, you know, national debt or national taxation, for example, income tax, typically this was introduced in times of crisis as a temporary measure. And then once people understood that um, uh, uh, there were advantages, you know, outside time of crisis, uh, then eventually it became a permanent feature. And um, in that sense, I think um, it, it is right to talk about this, um, if, if we manage to, to get this done, if we manage to get this, um, uh, as, as, as it's now called, the next generation EU, but, um, I, I, I'm, I'm old fashioned, I, perhaps I still call it recovery fund. We managed to get this off the ground. Um, and then I think, I think this would be genuinely Hamiltonian moment. And I see a political danger that those who are um, skeptical of um, Europe, they will see that um, what is now temporary may eventually become permanent and therefore they will be fiercely against it and some are. Um, and those who are more enthusiastic about Europe, they will have a tendency to say, well, isn't this just a temporary thing? That's not a real Hamiltonian moment. Uh, and so um, uh, um, if we are not careful, um, uh, this proposal by the European Commission will end up um, sort of in, in a difficult place between Eurosceptics fighting it vigorously um, and if you like Europhiles, not supporting it vigorously because they say, well, maybe it's not enough, maybe it's not the real thing. And I think that would be very dangerous um, and it would be a historic mistake. That's why I think the question goes to the heart of the matter. Um, and it is very important for both um, the friends and the skeptics of the European project to understand that yes, 
by itself, this is a temporary one-time thing, but in reality, of course, it does mean much more. Mm. Um, Alex, what is your uh, uh, take on this? Um, taking into account that the Czech Republic is probably one of the most Eurosceptic uh, nations, uh, isn't it? It depends on how you ask the questions and what the questions that you asked before the, the final question. But indeed, in terms of surveys, uh, it seems that the Czechs, they, they seem a little bit skeptical about, uh, not about the EU as such, but about the, the, the future, actually more federalization. And this is also my internal fight as a, as a government representative and as a, as a person, let's say, in a, um, as, a, as a private person, but in a way, and uh, what what Jakob said was was very very much exact. And he mentioned the Hamiltonian uh, moment before. Uh, this is something that could be understood by many, especially by by the uh, by the Euro optimists, but as a moment of something very active, something that Elisa also described in her introductory speech uh, as uh, as. Uh, as a, as a, that she is very happy and that it is a new era. Uh, at the same time, look at how we approach the economic aspects of the crisis. First, we looked at it as a strictly temporary um, crisis. Probably we talked at the beginning about months. We will see how the situation develops exactly, but we talked about months or even weeks uh, of, uh, of this crisis actually to hit. And the all focus, and the all determ determination of individual member states and governments was based on the fact that it is temporary. Therefore, we can afford to invest a lot and to get also into debt a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But that this is a debt that we will have to pay back at some point. Um, if we take this as a structural thing that will transform the responsiveness, then of course we will find a lot of new issues that have to be discussed. And I tried to, I mean, it's very difficult to put in, in, in words, actually, the heaviness and the horizontal debates that we are having on the level of the EU Council and the European Council. But uh, there is a feeling that it, we did not have enough time to explain it into detail, actually, what is really happening and how much action we need from the EU in order to transform the functioning of the EU. So therefore, the temporary character would be probably and will be probably uh, the uh, logical political outcome uh, of, of, the, of the whole issue. Nevertheless, and Jakob has mentioned it very, very clearly, um, there will be impact, let's say, on, uh, on, a, on a personal level on the fact that we have managed this crisis in this way. It could be also a negative impact in a very long term because in the very first weeks we've seen some hesitation. Uh, but I believe that in this respect it will not come back in the next seven year period of the MFF. It will come late, much later and uh, it will be probably uh, looking back actually in, a, in, a, in some years of time uh, to what we had as a debate and concluding that, yes, indeed, we can do it if we want, if we are pushed into it, but that we have not done in many countries, unfortunately, including mine, the homework of uh, explaining it to the citizens. Mm. And this is, this is a grave issue that uh, I, I have this, let's say, schizophrenia uh, between my personal convictions and also a representation of, of uh, myself as a, as a um, as, as part of the ministry uh, in terms of putting it in a, in a clear way. We will have to put it in a temporary measure as it is. Then we will start an intellectual debate on whether it could be structural and whether it could translate into some institutional debate. And one last sentence, we have not finished and we have not started even the debate on the future of the European Union. Uh, we, have, we were supposed to start the conference on the future of the EU on the 9th of May. This was mm. postponed. And I think that this, was, this could very much feed in into what we have in front of us with some delay probably, but in terms of the, some probable uh, changes, even institutional changes uh, for the period after the, new, uh, after the current commission uh, takes place, so after, uh, after 2024. 
Um, and, I, I, and, I, and Laszlo, Laszlo um, may yeah. I, um, I, I really like what, um, uh, what um, Alish said um, there at the end. Is it all right if I jump in or? Uh, Why don't you jump in for a short comment? Yes. Yeah. So, so I, I think, Alish, what you were saying is extremely important. If in the end this were just about, you know, a common debt instrument, I don't think um, we will be able to convince Europeans that this is the way to go. And I, um, I don't think we would uh, look back um, at um, these events in pride. I think we would be worrying. This only makes sense if we talk about a um, fiscal capacity with debt, with a fiscal capacity with revenues, and Elisa alluded to that, and my minister does that regularly, and, and it only makes sense, and that's even more important than debt and revenues, if we manage to spend the money on things that create genuine European value added. Mm. So if you like the quality of public finances, European public goods, things that really move us forward together. And only if we have these three ingredients and a convincing um, setup in terms of governance, uh, you know, whether you call it European Minister of Finance or something else, that's not important but that it is actually workable. Um, only then will we look back at this moment and say, yes, this was a truly Hamiltonian moment and move uh, Europe forward. If we just stay with, uh, you know, issuing uh, uh, debt jointly, this will not be enough. And I'm very grateful to Alesh to point that out. Yes, this, uh, these ideas very much coincide with uh, some of the comments we received from the audience. For example, I am reading here what uh, Ludo van Ooyen uh, said, who said that the hundreds of billions or trillions uh, may excite the politicians, MEPs and economists, uh, but the people need the narrative that they understand. And Judith Delheim is um, perhaps even more concrete, uh, suggesting that it, you know, we also need to see concrete proposals, initiatives on the social and the ecological dimensions of this new, so to speak, uh, revolutionary uh, initiatives. So I will um, uh, welcome your comments um, uh, shortly about, about these points. Uh, but let me highlight something because Alesh explained that the Czechs might be a little bit uh, Euro skeptic, they're not in the Eurozone, will not be um, anytime soon, um, but at least they are not frugal. And um, that's also one of the key questions uh, here, for example, from Matthias Riesler. Um, who ask how to convince the so-called frugal, frugal four about um, the new Franco-German paradigm, which uh, forms the basis for the new commission proposal as well. Now, here, on the other hand, I have a second uh, quiz, uh, because probably everybody knows who uh, constitute the frugal four now. Uh, but in the previous MFF debate, in 2012 and uh, 13, there was an, also a group of four, and they are coming on uh, the screen, voila. So this, again, is um, a multiple choice uh, question. Who was the original frugal four in 2013 when the commission, of which I was the part of, uh, proposed a modest increase of um, the seven-year EU budget, but the frugal four actually wanted to see a modest decrease of uh, the MFF, which eventually determined the outcome. So was it, uh, now it disappeared, uh, but it should come back one way or another. Uh, so then the question will be, if you can, uh, if you can vote on this, what was the uh, original composition of um, uh, the frugal four at that time? Uh, why does it matter? Partly for uh, history, but also because you may assume that if uh, a, a different approach prevailed um, in the previous MFF round, perhaps the whole um, Eurozone history would have been slightly uh, different. But was it uh, number one, Austria, Finland, Netherlands, Germany? Mm, or was it Germany, UK, Sweden, the Netherlands? Or I'm was sure. it Netherlands, was Luxembourg, more. UK and Austria? Or was it Sweden, UK, Finland, and Latvia? Is it possible to vote on this? 
it, uh, our audience voted already and uh, over 65% went for option one. Austria, option Finland. one, so they thought it was Austria, Finland, Netherlands, Germany, which is probably wrong. Uh, the reality is that two very large EU member states were among the frugal four. And of course, it was before the current coalition, so before the Social Democrats joined uh, the German uh, government, that Germany, UK, Sweden, together with the Netherlands, formed uh, this, uh, 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 this notorious uh, group, which ensured that uh, the EU budget remained a little bit minimalist in terms of uh, recovery cap capacity, but at the same time, shortly after, the so-called Juncker plan was launched um, to bring in new approaches. So, um, now we put um, history behind, and the question is how to convince the current frugal four? What will impress them? Do you want to start, or? Yeah, maybe just very shortly. I mean, I think what we have to underline, and we try to underline it in the cohesion debates and in the debates on in this uh, new grouping of uh, friends of ambitious Europe that have met uh, uh, well before the crisis, um, was the effect of internal market. I think that this is extremely important to, to tell individual member states in this frugal four, current ones, or basically the past ones, um, including UK uh, in this respect, that the internal market was the biggest and is the biggest redistributional channel inside the European Union. It is not the MFF, it is not the European budget, which is the, the biggest redistributional channel inside the EU. And those countries specifically, and even one by one even, are benefiting um, the most from the internal market. And to tell them that without the internal market working, without a crisis, without the labor crisis, without high levels of unemployment in Italy, Spain, or uh, in other countries, including Central Europe, uh, they would not benefit from the internal market, is the right argument. It's difficult to translate it into the discussion, and I think it still needs time to, to, to convince. But the argument through the internal market, I think, is the only valid one. I'm not sure how usable it is for, for the public uh, inside those countries, because they might not see the effect in their day-to-day -day life. But I think that this is the right uh, logic on how to approach this. Mm -hmm. Jakob, any thoughts? Yeah, so... so um, I think what is going to be critical is to um, uh, explain and remind that this is not about moral hazard. Um, because, of course, there are situations where moral hazard in, 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 in the EU does play a role. I mean, it exists and sometimes we can tolerate it and sometimes it's a bit much. Um, but this is a very exceptional crisis. and. Um, I found it quite remarkable how, um, how Chancellor Merkel um, managed to persuade um, some of her previous internal critics on Europe that this time is different. It, this is a different situation. And I think that's going to be key in order to convince um, uh, those who doubt um, that this is the right approach. And at a more, uh, that's, I, think, I think that's the key political argument, that this is not the time to worry about moral hazard. There are other times where one can legitimately uh, worry about it, but not now. Um, I think that's by far the most important uh, argument. And secondly, at a more technical level, because of course a proposal was put forward by, by those four countries, um, uh, more technically, um, the proposal that they put forward is very much based on, uh, on credit, um, uh, on, on uh, borrowing and lending. Uh, and I think there, in institutional terms, it is quite clear, uh, I mentioned it before, that at least in the euro area, we have an instrument that is able to provide credit um, at attractive rates to member states uh, who um, come to the conclusion that they require that kind of support. And therefore, to duplicate uh, the SM uh, by means of the recovery fund would simply not make a lot of sense technically. And I think taken together, that uh, should, uh, should um, uh, go a long way 
towards having a, a constructive discussion um, with those member states who are at the moment a little bit skeptical about it. Um, and, uh, and sort of one, one additional point that, um, I mean, I had the great pleasure to spend four and a half years in the European Parliament. Um, and I think in the end, if one manages to create an atmosphere for discussion where this is not about right and wrong, where this is not about um, you know, an atmosphere where people feel pressure, because in the end, um, Europe doesn't work by pressuring others. Um, but where, where this is an open, uh, open discussion in the, in, the, in the interest of enlightenment, um, I think there's a chance that uh, we will be able to pull this off together um, uh, with uh, everybody. You know, of course, there, there have to be some compromises, but, but coming together in a way that really provides the answer that, that Europe needs right now. And so um, while I don't know what the outcome will be, I'm cautiously optimistic that if we don't uh, do this as a kind of blame, blame game, but uh, do this as a serious discussion on what is necessary uh, for the future of Europe, chances are uh, that, that we will succeed together. Mm. Um, as you mentioned your years in the European Parliament, um, when um, uh, you witnessed the launch of the Oettinger proposal on the MFF, and in those times, um, I think um, one of the key discussions um, around the new MFF was the so-called rule of law conditionality. This is a question from Pavlina Yanebova in our discussion, who is probably watching us. Um, is there a chance still for a rule of law link between um, the MFF or significant parts of the MFF? Or this has been lost on the roadside when we revolutionized um, the the, the budgetary approach? What do you think about this? I'm asking this also because there is a link with the German presidency. I heard Michael Roth several times, the, uh, the, the, the Minister for European Affairs, but also Heiko Maas, Foreign Minister, uh, that this is very, very important for uh, the German presidency. It was not last week, but most maybe last year. Um, is it still on the agenda? Is it still something Germany will push for? Well, I, I imagine, uh, Laszlo, this, this, this question was meant for, for me. And uh, let me, because I dodged the question about the EU pre presidency previously a little bit, let me be uh, very clear. Um, while, of course, as you can imagine, we love planning, we have lots of plans, as everybody does who goes into a presidency, the truth is um, this presidency will be about one topic, and that's how to deal with COVID-19 and its consequences. And that will be the dominant feature of this presidency. And it's just a fact. Uh, does that mean that other things are not important? No. But does it mean um, that you know, anything will come close to the importance of this single issue? The answer is no. This is about dealing with COVID-19. And any issues that we will look at, including, and, and that's quite clear from today, including, of course, the challenging um, negotiations on the multi-annual financial framework, all of this, in the end, has to be seen through that lenses. And we, we cannot allow ourselves to fail. Um, and, of course, we cannot allow ourselves um, to, to spend, um, spend money um, on, on things that are not convincing. Um, either in substance or politically. And, um, and so um, it, 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 I think the answer to your question is, this is not going to be the most important, this is not going to be the defining issue, but the rule of law clearly is essential for the European Union. Um, so I would be very surprised if this topic were lost. It's mm -hmm. simply not going to be dominant. Mm. Alex? Well, th thank you very much for the question, because it is indeed, even though forgotten maybe for some time, especially since the uh, proposal um, uh, of the 13 countries, actually, or the declaration of the 13 countries that we had roughly a month ago on the temporary measures, um, we still think in, uh, in Prague that this is an issue that has to be, uh, that has to be de dealt with and that it is important to put it forward. And we have always declared on many levels that the conditionality on rule of law is something that we could, we could accept because it 
has to do with uh, how the internal market works and uh, how the money is distributed and the trust between member states is important in this level. So we think that it, this should not be forgotten. At the same time, as Jacob has said very clearly, uh, it, it's very difficult times. You have to act very quickly. Many times you have to take decisions where you do not have time to, um, to, to, to let's say, uh, go through all the procedures. Many countries have declared emergency statuses as mm. part of their constitutional um, orders so that they could take decisions more quickly. I think, I, I don't think that there should be somehow an embargo on, uh, on the current period, but I think what we should separate is the long-term effects of uh, rule of law uh, that deterioration in some countries on one side and uh, the current measures that are taken under the COVID crisis. And I know that it, this will not probably be the most important uh, topic for the German presidency, for the discussions um, as for the MFF, also for, for, for other discussions or creating the peer review mechanism. But at the same time, this is something that um, uh, still has to take place. I mean, the debate has not finished. As much as the Eurozone a debate has not finished actually before the crisis, I think also that the rule of law question has not finished uh, um, before the crisis. And that is why we have to still, you know, keep it in mind and, uh, and uh, not to forget it. And you can see actually here that uh, this picture is, is Tomasz Masaryk, the, the founder of Czechoslovakia, uh, a picture from 1918 that I have uh, above my head. And uh, he, he's a representative actually of, of a country which was the last democratic country keeping the rule of law until 1938, uh, before it was the last uh, country uh, over the Rhine uh, in, in, in Central Europe actually to keep the rule of law. Um, in, in democratic institutions inside the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia at that time. And uh, this is something that even though we might come stereotypically in a, in a, in a group of countries which you know, thinks that this is not an issue to be put together with cohesion, we have always said on many levels, on all the important levels, that this is an issue that we want to deal with. But uh, we should not separate it from the current measures that are sometimes taken under stress from the long-term uh, perspective that we have to, uh, that, that is still pending and the debate has to take place. Well, I, I think that, uh, uh, and uh, Laszlo, sorry, sorry, just to briefly jump in. I think what Alice just said is extremely helpful because there's a danger here of this becoming a debate about um, East and, Eastern and Western Europe. And that's something which will not end well. And so having a discussion where it is clear, this is not about East versus West. This is not about, uh, you know, keeping, uh, in, uh, reducing uh, uh, the support uh, for dynamic economic development for regions in Europe that need it. This is specifically about the rule of law and certain things that in the European Union, um, if we sort of start tolerating them, we go down a very dangerous route. And um, I think that's the way to go and, and uh, to uh, perhaps um, introduce an element of precision. It is clear that the German presidency, of course, there are high hopes, we have high hopes. We will not solve the problem of the rule of law uh, within the next six months. But if we do not contribute in a serious way as part of our presidency towards um, approaching a solution to that serious problem, then of course uh, um, uh, um, uh, we would have done something wrong. And I think that's the way to look at it. But, but, but let me stress again, the, 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 the challenge at everybody's for, uh, um, sort of, uh, that, uh, um, on everybody's mind right now is COVID-19 and it would be naive to say otherwise. Thank you. I think it was extremely clear from both of you and we, we all did our bit for history and I suggest that in the remaining minutes we all do a little bit about the future because um, you know, today a new expression, the next generation, also comes into the budgetary policy. And when we move um, uh, from balanced budget towards debt instruments, 
especially common debt instruments. Uh, we take care of the next generation. Uh, more precisely, we leave a debt behind for the next uh, uh, generation. Uh, one of the uh, viewers, um, our friend Robin Ugnor Noel, he's uh, asking um, uh, you know, about, about the, the impact on the future and um, whether, whether we can also ensure that it's not only a debt instrument uh, which is created, but, but some guarantees for a social investment or taking care of the welfare regimes of um, the EU member states. Do you see a scope for this kind of more positive uh, approach of uh, you know, taking care of, uh, of the next generation apart from you know, surviving this current uh, COVID crisis and the recession it generated? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. I think um, um, we didn't talk about it a lot, but of course, uh, Laszlo, with you being here, we should have. Um, one of the um, uh, uh, some, somewhat, I think, underappreciated um, steps that uh, uh, was taken was to establish Shore. Um, and when you were commissioner, um, you were working on unemployment uh, insurance and unemployment reinsurance, uh, as I prefer to think of it. Um, and Assure is a major step in that direction. Um, and its significance must not be underestimated at the same time. And let me also be very clear on this. Unless we move much, much, much further, and I don't think it will happen anytime soon in the organization, um, in, 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 in the laws that govern our labor markets, that govern our welfare states, unless we do that, um, having a truly European setup um, it, it will not work. Um, and that's why one needs to think very, very carefully what are the kind of things that we can do on that front um, without a full harmonization. And um, sure, and unemployment reinsurance are ways to do just that, to live with the fact for the time being that our national regimes in that respect um, are. Um, rather different, and they are set to stay relatively different um, for, for the medium term, um, and then see what can we do anyway that makes sense and moves Europe forward. So um, I, think, I think we are looking for those kind of opportunities where we're sure, whereas I'm a little bit skeptical um, of people saying, well, how about a, a, a full-blown um, social um, uh, welfare state at the EU level uh, right now. I don't think this is something we're going to see um, within the next couple of years. But as a, as a longer run idea, um, it's attractive. But um, it, it has enormous prerequisites. And so I would warn uh, against getting carried away on that front. Mm -hmm. Anish? I mean, so certainly, I mean, this is something that has to be welcomed by far, actually. The SURE is one, the, 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 the program SURE is one of the uh, programs that is somehow taking place of this Hamiltonian uh, transformation. And uh, we have seen long debates during also your uh, time as, as a commissioner, Laszlo. Uh, on uh, on the reinsurance or insurance schemes of the unemployment, and in this respect, this is this is a big thing. This is indeed, if I have to consider something, and if I have to point out one uh, element actually of the current debate that might uh, have an impact on the future, this is this one, because that would be and is going to be readily usable for the next crisis. It will be an element that always somehow can mobilize itself. And uh, I think that this is, this is a quite also a good contribution of the European uh, social democratic uh, debate on uh, the development of the European Union, because this is something of a mutualization, not just of the financial and economic instruments, but indeed to going into the very um, depth of uh, the economics of uh, individual member states. And this is something that we have, uh, as Jakob has said in his very uh, first uh, words, uh, the Kurzarbeit, the short, um, uh, short limitation, exactly. Um, this is something that 
basically all the countries have applied and they are looking for an instrument, all of them, how to finance it. And many member states are able to finance it from themselves and many are not, but all of them actually look for a, a sensible way how to uh, manage it in this respect. And there will be always differences and we're coming back a little bit to the debate before on uh, our capacities on this. But uh, even though our capacity is around 30% of our GDP, I mean, to reach the Maastricht criteria, uh, we still are in a very similar situation actually to, to other countries. So the SURE program in this respect is, is something that could uh, provide us with uh, a real uh, proposal for the future. And it's great that Laszlo has created actually a basis for this, uh, for this future some, some years back. That's very generous um, of you. Of course, um, I think we have to celebrate those who are not incumbent because the heavy lifting is, um, is, 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 is definitely for them. And this is just the start of this um, uh, reform process and, and we will still see a lot of important uh, debates. Um, we shortly have to close. And uh, of course, um, in, in, in other, on other occasions, we will come back to many details of this. But let me ask a final question because, um, you know, yesterday in the discussion, there was a lot of reference to Roosevelt, today to Hamilton. Why only Americans? I have nothing against the Americans if they are progressive, uh, but, um, but can, we, can you, both of you perhaps, highlight a European inspiration, one uh, short, point you would make, uh, which, is, which would be, let's say, genuinely European and inspire us, progressive economists, in this uh, current period? Difficult question. Jakob, do you want to take it? You already pointed to Masaryk, so maybe Jakob could come with Billy Brandt. Um, uh, are, are you talking about a, a personality or well, it uh, can be a personality or an episode, uh, an epoch-changing moment, a game-changer. Let's say, let's say I, I'm going to Garibaldi uh, and to, to, to the Italian Revolution and you know, saying that, and this is a long-term thing, this is not part of this crisis, but you know, uh, there is this very famous sentence from uh, the Geopardo, Geopardo of uh, everything has to change so that nothing changes. And uh, I think that in this crisis, this is an opportunity for, for, for this, for uh, like a, a mild, uh, progressive, uh, and still a little bit conservative revolution uh, that we can keep up our European way of life, that we can keep the position of Europe inside uh, the global sphere. But at the same time, we have to change on the inside. We have to really reform how we behave in terms of uh, trade relations, in terms of how uh, the geopolitics and of the relations with our neighborhood. And um, this would be maybe the positive thing, but uh, so this is Garibaldi. And the other one is, uh, uh, you know, Masaryk's uh, motto, uh, do not steal and not to be afraid, let's say. So that's, uh, that's also another one, a uh, quick translation of the, of the, of the Czech quote. So um, let me be very boring, but I, um, <laughs> I, I think um, sort of part uh, of what we can back look back to is, is of course, uh, Jean Monnet, who not only said, L'Europe sera dans les crises et sera la somme des solutions apportées à ces crises, um, but also very much thought about how to move forward in that way. And so I think that's definitely an inspiration in, in, in that moment. But um, in terms of, you know, the time period, um, when you look at the way in which Europe was created, it was very much about geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And um, I think um, if we um, manage to realize collectively that we are in the 21st century now, Alish alluded to it, um, it's, this is not about uh, you know, Germany or France or um, uh, uh, Spain or Italy. This is about um, Europe in a rather large globalized world. Um, I think if we manage to, um, at the same time, um, uh, uh, to be aware of the opportunity that crises like that present themselves for the um, uh, uh, institutional development of Europe, 
Um, and at the same time, we realize that the question has changed. Um, uh, then I think, uh, and, and this is partly geopolitics and not nitty, sort of the nitty gritty um, normal politics of, of the European Union, I think then we're much more likely to do what is necessary right now. Um, I think that's the best answer I, I can come up with uh, on the spur of the moment. Thank, Thank you so much, um, uh, both Jakob and Anes, and it was very uh, kind of you to make these historic uh, references. Uh, these will be also available on video, uh, because uh, the recording of yesterday's and today's conference will remain uh, accessible, not only in full length, but also as a kind of little selection or a kind of video clip uh, for uh, providing input for future discussions on progressive economic uh, policy um, in the FEPS uh, uh, network. Um, I would like to thank uh, all the panelists, uh, Elisa Ferreira, who is not anymore with us, but Jakob Weizsäcker, Alex Mellar, and uh, also the team that organized uh, this um, in FEPS, David Rinaldi, Elian Omez and Elena Gilles, they helped um, this to take uh, place also yesterday, although they remained invisible most of the time, but without their work, this would not have been uh, possible. And they are already preparing the next steps. Uh, let me also uh, take a few seconds to announce this, um, that um, also continuing um, uh, the analysis of the recovery strategy, next Tuesday on the 2nd of June, together with the Trade Union Institute, ETUI, FEPS will co-organize um, an event. Um, and um, in this uh, further experts, Peter Bofinger, Agnes Benassi-Curie uh, will speak, uh, together with political leaders like Paul Magnet and uh, Ludwig Ascher, uh, leaders of uh, the Belgium, as well as the Dutch uh, socialists. Um, so please uh, come back on Tuesday if uh, you're still interested in further discussions, but also the future European scenarios uh, beyond the details of the recovery uh, strategy. FEPS has also launched a series which is called the COVID response uh, papers. And you find also these online uh, there are already several, including on the shore instrument, which was mentioned several times uh, today, but also about other aspects of the COVID response strategy in the European Union. Thank you very much for the participation uh, today, and I wish you all the best after this uh, revolutionary, although somewhat counterintuitive day in the European Union. See you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.